Hello and welcome to this Foster Care Institute online training webinar, Self-Harm and Self-Injury in Children. I'm your host, Dr. John DeGarmo, the founder and director of the Foster Care Institute. I am also an author of several foster care books, an international trainer and speaker, a foster and adoptive parent. Perhaps my biggest role, though, is that of father father to 60 plus children who have come through my home as a biological foster and adoptive father. Our goal during this webinar is to bring awareness of what self-harm and self-injury is. And our key objectives throughout this webinar is to increase your awareness of what self-harm and self-injury is in children and to gain an understanding of how to develop and implement strategies designed to best aid children who self-harm. Throughout this webinar, we're going to look at a couple examples of children who have self-harmed themselves and in their own words. We put them in their own words so we can better understand perhaps why they're doing this or what they're feeling. Our first example is this. A teenager said, it puts a punctuation mark on what I'm feeling on the inside. Foster care has so many myths and misunderstandings, misconceptions attached to it, myths and misconceptions that society has believed for quite some time. Myths and misconceptions that the media and the narrative continues to unfold and, and people believe those myths. And I did as well. I had those myths, those misconceptions, those misunderstandings about foster parent before I became a foster parent myself. Well, just like foster care, there are many myths and misconceptions associated with self-harm, associated with self-injury. The next several slides, we're going to look at what those myths are, and then we're going to pair them with the truth about that myth. There is a myth that self-harm is an attempt at seeking attention, and it is attention-seeking behavior. Self-harm is an attention-seeking behavior that the child does, or the teenager does. They self-harm themselves to crave attention, to find the attention they're missing in their life. This is the myth. The truth is this. Self-harm is often surrounded in shame. For those people who harm themselves or who injure themselves, they do so, but they're ashamed of it. Those who attempt self-harm, those who injure themselves, well, they are ashamed of it, and they will often cover their attempts, attempts to harm themselves, the attempts to injure themselves with bandages, long sleeve shirts, jackets, sweatshirts, pullovers, and other types of clothing. There is a myth that those who injure themselves, those who harm themselves, do not feel any pain that they bring upon themselves. The pain they induce upon themselves is not felt. The truth is this. Those who do injure themselves do feel the pain. Yet, while they injure themselves, the pain is sometimes, and many times indeed, bearable, as it may provide some sort of relief from their emotions, the emotions that are overwhelming them, the emotions that are consuming them, the emotions that they are trying to escape from. Perhaps you've heard this myth. Self-harm is very rare in people. This is a myth. The truth is self-harm and self-injury is not uncommon. According to the United States National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health, there is a prevalence of self-harm. It's 17.2% of, of people who harm themselves do it during adolescence. 13.4% of those who injure themselves purposely do so during adulthood. And those who harm themselves, 5.5% of those, percent of those are indeed older adults. One myth that is quite common is that self-injury, self-harm, is a way to manipulate others. 
The truth is this. Those who harm themselves, those who injure themselves purposely, they do so because it is often a time or an attempt, if you will, a cry for help. They are seeking not necessarily attention, but they're looking for help. Help from you. Help from someone that they might know. This self-injury, this self-harm, might be seen as a sign of desperation. It is maybe a last attempt to get to your attention or someone's attention. Simply, it can be a plea for help. Those who injure themselves might be begging for your help. There is a myth that only adults engage in self-harm. The truth is this. Self-harm happens most with teenagers and young adults. It is important to note, though, it is quite important to note that as it happens with teenagers, I'm sorry, as it happens with adults, teenagers and even young children may also attempt self-injury. One myth that is prevalent in society is that self-harm is only cutting. The truth is this. While self-harm does include cutting oneself, and it is the most well-known and it is the most visible form of self-injury, self-harm can also include hitting oneself, burning oneself, or even biting oneself. And we will look at forms of self-injury and self-harm later during this Foster Care Institute training webinar. The myth is that self-injury is a phase it's just a phase that people will grow out of. It's a phase that teenagers go through and will eventually grow out of. The truth is this. Self-injury should be taken with the absolute and utmost seriousness from you. And self-injury requires immediate intervention. Those who attempt self-harm often suffer from depression, and they need your help. Perhaps society shows us this through movies and television and the media, and the myth that self-injury is something that only girls do. The truth is this. There are studies that indicate between 30 to 40 percent of boys also self-injure. There is the myth that self-harm is only an attempt at suicide. The truth is this. Those who harm themselves are intentionally trying to deal with or to cope with or to manage their own trauma, their personal trauma, their anxiety. Anxiety that may be overwhelming them. Anxiety that they simply do not know how to take care of or treat personally. Self-harm may be a temporary relief from how they are feeling, from their emotions, though it is not necessarily a permanent ending or attempt at suicide, if you will. There is the myth that those who have abused attempt self-injury and self-harm. Only those who have been physically abused attempt self-injury, attempt self-harm. Yet the truth is different. Not everyone who self-harms has been abused in some way. Now it is true that those who have a history of some sort of abuse are at greater risk of self-injury. Not everyone who does perform self-injury or harms himself has a history of abuse. There is the myth that only young people commit self-injury in an attempt to fit in socially, to be acceptable in a peer group, to fit in with others they're trying to associate with. The truth is different. Self-harm is often a result of someone being bullied by others. Self-harm is a result of depression, of anxiety. Self-harm may be a result of not fitting in with others. 
And the last myth that you might be familiar with is this. Self-injury is unable to be treated. The truth is far different. Those who self-harm can indeed be treated, yet this treatment may take a great deal of time. It may take a great deal of patience, and most importantly, it takes understanding. We look at the words of another teenager who says this, I feel relieved and less anxious after I cut. The emotional pain slowly slips away into the physical pain. Now we've looked at many of the myths associated with self-harm, but what is self-harm? When someone says self-harm, what does that actually mean? Well, let's look at these. Self-harm or self-injury can be a way of dealing with one's emotional pain, of one's anxiety. Now, if you are a foster parent or a caregiver or a caseworker, then you most likely know that children in foster care are filled with anxiety, filled with anxiety from the pain or the trauma they've experienced. And many times these children struggle to deal with their anxiety. Their anxiety overwhelms them. They do not know how to process the emotions they're feeling. Self-harm can be a way of dealing with this. It is an action that includes anything done to purposefully and to intentionally hurt, harm, or injure oneself. So how does one do that? How does one purposefully, intentionally harm, hurt, or injure themselves? Well, there are many ways of self-harm. Perhaps the most common way of self-harm, and as we noted earlier, the most easily identifiable way, is cutting oneself. We also noted earlier that burning oneself might be a form of self-harm as well. Biting and scratching oneself are also forms of self-harm. But there are other forms of self-harm. These include scraping oneself, their body against perhaps cement or wood. Hitting oneself is a form of self-harm. Picking at wounds, scabs at their skin is a form of self-harm. Swallowing poisonous substances or inappropriate objects is another form of self-harm. And there are more. Hitting oneself or banging one's head against a wall or a table or a desk, whatever it might be, these are forms of self-harm. Punching things or throwing your body against a wall or other hard objects is a form of self-harm. Sticking objects into your skin, such as needles or pins or knives, even screwdrivers, it's a form of self-harm. Finally, purposefully and intentionally preventing wounds from healing is a form of self-harm. Just a moment ago, we talked about picking scabs or wounds. When one has scabs or wounds on their body and they pick these off, they're preventing themselves from healing. Again, this is a form of self-harm. A nine-year-old once said this about self-harm. It's a way to have control over my body because I can't control anything else in my life. Does that sound familiar to you? Many times children come into foster care and they feel they have no control over anything in their life. Not having control of being removed from their home, being removed from their mother and their father, sometimes being removed from their siblings. No control of being removed from their house, their home, their pets, their siblings, their grandparents, relatives, cousins, schools. No control of being placed into a foster home, perhaps your home. No control of being removed and placed into a new school system. No control of having to go to the therapist, the counselor. No control in their life. For some children, they turn to self-harm because of this. Let's read this quote again. It's a way to have control over my body because I can't control anything else 
in my life. Now, we've looked at some of the ways to self-harm, but what might be some of the reasons? Why might a child, a teenager, a young adult, or an adult for that matter, why might they harm themselves? Why might they purposefully injure themselves? Well, some may harm themselves in an attempt to deal with the feelings that overwhelm them. Feelings they simply do not know how to process. Feelings they don't know how to deal with, so to speak. These feelings may include feelings of feeling empty, feelings of guilt or rage, feelings of sadness, even feelings of self-loathing. Some may harm themselves purposefully in an attempt to distract themselves from the emotions that are overwhelming them. In addition, some may injure themselves due to difficult life circumstances. Circumstances that they're having a, they're struggling trying to deal with. Others may purposefully injure themselves or harm themselves as they hope to express feelings. Feelings they don't know how to put into words. Feelings they don't know how to talk about out loud, to describe. Feelings they don't know how to express. There are those who may injure themselves or harm themselves as an attempt to release the stress that they're feeling, the tension that is in their body, the pain they have experienced in their life. Some may harm themselves as they feel a sense of control. As we noted earlier, the young nine-year-old said he did, not have feeling, he did not have control in his life. Well, some may injure themselves because they feel they have a sense of control. They can control the fact that they can harm themselves. They can control the fact that they purposefully and intentionally injure themselves. They have control of this. Others may harm themselves because it helps them to relieve or release any personal guilt they have. Many times children in foster care place into a foster care environment. They experience feelings of guilt. And I've discussed this in some of our webinars here at the Foster Care Institute. And I'm reminded of a 13-year-old child who came to our house he was the oldest one of a sibling group of five. He, this 13-year-old, was in charge of the family, so to speak. He was in charge of getting his younger siblings to school each day, dressed, breakfast, and to school. He was in charge of feeding his siblings. He was even in charge of the family finances, 13-year-old family finances, because his mother was struggling with her drug addiction, and there was no father figure. When he and his four siblings were placed into our home as foster children, as children from foster care, this 13-year-old was riddled with guilt. He felt he let his siblings down. He felt he let his mother down. Fortunately, he did not turn to self-harm. Some may harm themselves in an attempt to punish themselves, a sort of self-punishment, if you will. Finally, there are those who may injure themselves purposefully, as they believe it helps them to feel alive, a sense of feeling alive, instead of feeling numb. We look at this teenager who said this about their self-harm. I usually feel like I have a black hole in the pit of my stomach. At least, if I feel pain, it's better than feeling nothing. So we have looked at why one might self-harm themselves and how one might self-harm themselves. Now, how do you help? 
how do you help somebody who has these feelings, who is injuring themselves by picking at their wounds, injuring themselves by banging their head against the wall, injuring themselves by swallowing poisonous objects, injuring themselves in an attempt to avoid or to have a release from their own personal trauma, anxiety, and pain. How do we help? What can we do? Well, perhaps the most important thing we can do is this. Recognize the signs, what it might look like. Those who self-injure themselves often self-isolate themselves. They're isolated from others. They do not attend social gatherings. They might not try to avoid going to school. Another sign of self-injury that you might be aware of is those children who have a low sense of self, or they have very, very little self-esteem. As you can imagine, one sign of self-injury is scars on the skin and patterns, or maybe even in shapes. Other signs might be this. Those who injure themselves purposely often have unexplained or frequent injuries. They often have cuts and burns on their skin, perhaps their forearms or their arms or maybe even their legs. And they many times have excuses. When you ask, how did this happen? They're quick to have an excuse for it. Those who self-harm many times are impulsive. As you can imagine, they have difficult times handling emotions as their anxieties might be overwhelming them. Those who self-harm often attempt to conceal their injuries. We talked about this earlier at the beginning of this presentation. They may be wearing long sleeves or pants even on the hottest of days. It might be 95 or even 100 degrees. And they might be wearing a long sleeve shirt, pants, maybe even a jacket, in an attempt to hide their cuts, their bruises, their burnings. Finally, those who have very tumultuous relationships or even avoid relationships, this might be a sign perhaps that they are injuring themselves. Those who injure themselves need your support. They need support from somebody. Now, despite the fact that those actions of self-injury and self-harm, they, they're ones that you simply do not understand of. You don't understand why they might be hurting themselves. And very likely, you do not approve of it. The very time, it is so important. It is essential indeed that you are supportive of the person, that you are supportive of the individual. While you may not approve or understand it, you still must support them. Reassure that person that you are there for him. If someone is hurting themselves purposefully, these are some things that you might want to say to them. You might want to say this. I noticed some marks on your arm, and I'm worried because I care about you. Tell me, are you hurting yourself? You might want to say this. Hey, I can see that you're in a lot of pain. Do you want to tell me what's been going on? You might want to say this. So, what gives you the urge to hurt yourself? You might want to say, I'll do anything I can, but I can't help you alone. Can we get you some support? And finally, you might want to say this. Hey, it's okay if you don't want to talk about it now. I'm here whenever you want to talk about it. I want to thank Carolyn Todd and Self.com for these five fantastic sayings. If you know somebody who is hurting themselves, if they're harming themselves, perhaps even a child in your home, it's so important 
that you do not pass any sort of judgment upon them. Do not pass judgment upon those who self-harm themselves. When you do, when you do pass judgment upon them, it might quite simply cause them to shut down from you. And this will prevent you from being able to help them. So, no judgment calls. At the same time, do not be dismissive of it. Do not dismiss a person's thoughts, their actions, their feelings regarding self-injury. Do not make fun of them or ridicule them or cut them down, so to speak, of their actions, of their self-harm either. We all like reminders in our life of some kind. So remind them. They need that reminder from you. They need to be reminded from you of the many positive qualities and the things that they do so well. They need to hear that from you. Let them know how important they are to you. Let them know how, how much you care for them and how much you love them. Let them know how, if, they, if anything should happen to them, how hurt you would be. Find ways every single day to praise them in some way. Indeed, as we've mentioned here before at the Foster Care Institute, children need to hear words of praise. We all need to hear words of praise every single day. For those who are cutting themselves and injuring themselves, you need to find ways to offer them praise in some fashion all the time. Try to be understanding. Try to somehow understand why someone might wish to hurt themselves, why they're trying to injure themselves, why they're cutting themselves, why they're burning themselves, why they're slamming their head against the wall. Try to find some sense of understanding. Is it because they're struggling with anxiety? Is it because they have low self-esteem? Is it because they're trying to avoid the feelings they have? Is it because they feel so numb and empty inside. Try to understand this and look to better understand their feelings behind it, as well as any mental health issues they may be struggling with. Now, this is important. No promises to those who are hurting themselves. No promises from you to those who may be purposefully and intentionally harming themselves. Do not ask someone to promise to stop hurting themselves as well. This might create, yes, additional stress within them. If you ask them to promise to stop, that might create more stress inside of them, including guilt. Encourage those people who are self-injuring or self-harm. Encourage them in very patient, very compassionate, calm tones to seek help. Offer to help them or assist them in finding the help that they do need. Because most likely this is not something you're going to be able to stop themselves yourself. They need professional help. Now, there are those times when medication might be necessary? If so, always, always, always ask the doctor and the caseworker beforehand. Consult with the doctor. Consult with the caseworker beforehand. Before you give the child any medication, you must go through your doctor and you must go through the caseworker beforehand and, of course, Document. Document. Any time they take the medication, you should have a medication log. And we talk about this in other webinars here at the Foster Care Institute. Let me start this just one more time. When you give a child medication, which might be necessary in regards to self-harm self and self-injury, you must consult the doctor and the caseworker first, and you must document every time that child takes that medication. And again, we, we go into that in much detail with the Foster Care Institute. Check out the webinar on documentation. 
As we noted earlier, there are times when professional therapy and counseling may also be of help for both the child and your family. As we've mentioned here, the foster care do. when I have a problem with our air conditioning unit in our home, I can't fix it. I am not an AC mechanic. I'm going to call up the air conditioning professional, the heating and air guy, so to speak. When my car has a problem, I'm taking it to a mechanic. When my child has a toothache, I'm going to the dentist with that child. When my daughter has to get new glasses, I'm going to the optometrist. Because I'm not an expert in every field, and my friend, neither are you. So do not feel any sense of embarrassment or shame or guilt if you take your child to a professional therapist or counselor. What you're doing is you're being proactive. You're seeking ways to find the best help available to that child. And that means you're a great parent because you recognize you can't do this all by yourself. So find a professional therapist and counseling for the child, and maybe even for your family as well, and let your caseworker know. And as we just mentioned here, make sure you properly document all that occurs. Any time the child in your home hurts themselves, injure themselves, you need to document what happened, when it occurred, where it occurred, how you responded, how the child responded to your response. If possible, take pictures. Take pictures of the cutting on the arm. Take pictures of the bruises. Record if possible and ask your caseworker if you can record and if you can take pictures because you have to have this documentation. This will help any possible allegations or accusations that might be made about your family, about the child itself. So make sure you document all that occurs. And again, we go into much more detail in the Foster Care Institute training about our documentation and foster parenting. Now, when you do document this, anytime a child hurts themselves, anytime the child hurts themselves, you need to make sure you document it and call the caseworker as soon as possible. You need to share this information with the with the caseworkers as soon as possible. When that child cuts himself, you need to address it, you need to document it then, and then you text or call or email, or hopefully all three, your caseworker. And if you do not hear back from your caseworker, you call and email them again. And you continue to do so until you get a hold of the caseworker. Again, when that child hurts themselves purposefully, injure themselves purposefully. The first thing you do is you address it with, of course, calm and patient and understanding tones. You document it. You let the caseworker know. And then you find the best possible help. We have over 55 hours. In fact, we're growing to over 60 hours of online training webinars here at the Foster Care Institute. And if you're not a special member, I encourage you to do so. For much more, check out the book, The Foster Care Survival Guide, the essential guide for today's foster parents. Indeed, we have a number of best-selling books available at the Foster Care Institute, and I'm sure there's one right just for you. For much more about this webinar or others, visit the Foster Care Institute at Dr. John DeGarmo, FosterCare.com. Follow me on Facebook at Dr. John DeGarmo, Twitter, Dr. John DeGarmo, LinkedIn, and YouTube with the same. And email me with any questions you might have about this webinar or anything else at Dr. John DeGarmo at gmail.com. The lifestyle of a foster parent, of a kinship parent, of an adoptive parent, the lifestyle of a parent is <laughs> us. It can be challenging, it can be a struggle at times, and it can be hard. But what a wonderful journey it is to, to, be, to be a parent of a child. I want to thank you for all that you do for children in foster care. Whatever role you might play, thank you for all that you do for children in need. Thank you for what you do with children in crisis. For the Foster Care Institute, I'm Dr. John DeGarmo.